Testing. Hey, good morning. How are you doing today? Tired? A little bit? Okay. This is Tuesday, three more days, and then a big event this Sunday, right? Yeah. So I think that we're actually missing uh, three classes today. They're on a field trip, uh, UAV, Medalytics, and the Assistive Technologies are on a field trip, so they're not here. But let's just go through and welcome today's speaker, starting with the race car. I, before that, I actually forgot to ask my standard question. So what is BWSI? Inspirational. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cogworks. Metalytics uh, is not here, so CubeSat. Uh, yeah, embedded system security. Uh, hacking a 3D printer. Okay. Uh, uh, remote sensing. Uh, UAS SAR. Uh, did I miss anybody? Okay, I think that's it. And our team from Mexico. Okay. So today we have a really, really, really interesting talk. I think our there was a news article just came out, I think, last yesterday. You may have seen it. I think the team discovered the exoplanet, planet orbiting around the star. That's like smallest and the closest. Do you believe there is another intelligence out there? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think today's your lucky day. You're going to hear all about what we are doing to try to find that. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Natalia Guerrero, Guerrero uh, for a very interesting talk today. Great. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? So my name is Natalia Guerrero. I work here at MIT on a spacecraft called TESS. And I'll be talking to you a little bit about what TESS does, how it was built, how it was launched and what we're doing in the field of exoplanets and what we're trying to discover. So I work at the Institute for Astrophysics, just three buildings down. Um, I was actually an MIT alum. I came here and graduated in 2014. I studied physics with a focus in astronomy. And I think it's so great that you get the opportunity as high school students to learn about engineering, learn about some of the really exciting technical problems that we're trying to solve here at MIT and MIT Lincoln Lab. So the first thing I want to start thinking about is Earth. So, excuse me, I would like you to click. Yes? No? OK. So the first thing I would like to talk about is Earth. So we look at this picture of Earth taken from space, from the Apollo 11 spacecraft. And what do we see? We see it's blue, it's brown, it's green. What else do you notice? Some clouds, some atmosphere. It's not flat. <laughs> so there's already things that we're starting to notice about Earth that make it unique and make it this very special place to live and a place that keeps us alive, which is very important. But if we look at the rest of our solar system, and some of the bodies that are orbiting the sun, we see that we're very unique in our solar system. The Earth is just one planet among many. And we actually look really different, even from our nearest neighbor, Venus and Mars. So Mars is much smaller than we are. And Venus, even though that we're the same size, its atmosphere is so much thicker and it's so much more hostile to life than we are. So we have a lot of questions about the, what, are we, what are we doing here on Earth? What, how did our solar system form? And why did, why did Earth form differently from other planets? And so, for example, Jupiter and Saturn, they're these really big planets. Why are they out there at the, at the edge, past the, asteroid, past the asteroid belt? Why is Pluto this rocky planet all the way at the end? We're trying to figure out these patterns, and is there a pattern? So this is an exciting time, because now we're realizing that there are planets that are actually really different from the ones we see in our solar system. Our solar system is actually part of a larger family tree of many different kinds of planets. And we just fit in one part of this, one branch of this family tree. 
Most planets form out of what is called a protoplanetary disk, so a big flying saucer of gas and dust that's orbiting a star as, uh, shortly after it forms, and these eventually accrete into planetesimals and eventually planets. And so we have super-Earths in other planetary systems, things that are smaller than Neptune but larger than Earth, mini Neptunes, and then giant planets. So these are other varietals of planets that we don't see in our solar system. So that leads us to a big question. How unique is our solar system? Are we really a really common thing, or is, are we really unique? And so I think that's a really interesting question, and there's a lot of different ways that humans in recent years have tried to go about solving it. So actually, the field of exoplanets is relatively new. Exoplanets weren't actually detected until the late 80s, early 90s, and so this field has only been alive for maybe 20 years, 20, 30 years. One of the ways that we try to detect exoplanets is through something called the transit method. So this is when you have a star and a planet going around it, and the planet blocks out a tiny fraction of that star's light. And so that's called the transit. And then when the, star, when the planet goes around the star and goes behind it, that's called an occultation. And so you can measure a, a dip in the star's brightness when it goes in front, and then an even smaller dip when it goes behind. And so we can actually see transits in our own solar system. This is Mercury crossing over the surface of our sun. And this is something that we're able to see. And actually, there will be a transit of Mercury in front of the sun this November. So that's something to look forward to. And so let's say that we have a planet going around its host star. We can actually measure the brightness of that star very accurately with telescopes and say, OK, when a planet passes in front of its host star, it blocks out a tiny amount of that light, and that makes a dip. And so you can say, well, is that dip bigger or smaller when you have a smaller or bigger planet? Turns out, bigger planet means a bigger dip, smaller planet, smaller dip. And then if you have multiple planets, you see that you have multiple dips and really interesting patterns of dips that occur. And so these dips, these transits, are what give us information about the planet's size, about its temperature, um, and about how close in it is to its host star. So one of the interesting details about how close a planet is to its host star is whether or not it's in that star's habitable zone, whether or not there can be liquid water on the surface of that star, because that, for now, is a thing that we associate with habitability, with the ability of a planet to sustain life. So if a planet's too close in, it's too hot. It's too far out, it's too cold. Often, as we'll learn, as we've started to learn, if a star is really active, if it's giving a lot of, off a lot of flares, it's also not great for sustaining an atmosphere. So how do we detect these? So it turns out that these transits are really small. They're about 1% of the total brightness of that star's light. And so you need really powerful telescopes to look after, go look for these. So these are telescopes like Kepler. Kepler ran from 2009 up until last year. It was a really wonderful mission. It discovered thousands of exoplanets, over 2,000 exoplanets, and really changed the way that we look at our night sky told us all about these different kinds of planets and different kinds of planetary systems that we see. And so Kepler, this map shows you when we look out in concentric rings from our solar system out to 10, 100, 1,000 light years, really far distances at those stars, Kepler was able to sort of find planets along the cone that it was observing in one spot in the sky. And these little blue planets are planets that were discovered by other telescopes but you can start to see Kepler is building a really good picture of planets in one direction. And so this was over 2,000 planets that were discovered, and we can start to see this is a decent population. This is starting to be something of a census of planets. And then after Kepler had to go to sleep, went up to the, the big telescope farm in the sky, uh, we, it passed on the planet hunting torch to test. And so TESS has taken, is this space mission that has taken the lead on finding planets. So how does TESS work? This is TESS. It's about this big in reality, this big around. It has four cameras. And it looks at the night sky for 27 days at a time in this long vertical strip called a sector. A sector is divided up into squares, one square per camera. And so the camera's field of view is 24 by 24 degrees. And if you stack four of those cameras, you can see a strip of light, a strip of the sky that's 24 by 96 degrees. And so what we do next is we tile the sky with these sectors. So first we started on the southern hemisphere of the sky. So that's the sky that you can see from Australia, the South Pole. 
and we looked at each one of those sectors for 27 days each, and then we turned around the telescope, actually just two weeks ago, we finally finished. This has been a year of observations to get the bottom half of the sky, and now we're looking at the northern hemisphere. And this is really exciting because it means that TESS has started its second year of observation. And so, um, but how big are these really? Uh, just to give you a point of reference, the constellation Orion, has anyone here seen Orion in the night sky? Yes? Even in Cambridge, that's, that's great because Cambridge is really bright. It's hard to see the stars here. Um, so one test camera can fit all of Orion in it. So tonight or the next night that it's not cloudy, go outside and look at Orion and think, test. And if you, if you want to also get an idea of how much 24 degrees is, just go like this. I'm sure it'll make you lots of friends. Um, and this amount of hand span on the sky is about 25 degrees. So the next time someone asks you that at a party, you'll be able to whip that right out. Um, so, whoops, spoiler alert. Um, so to give you an idea again, so I talked about Kepler a little bit, and that was this one spot in the sky that it stared at. That's that little yellow square. And so that's, that fits in one test camera, which is amazing. It gives you an idea of TESS's full potential to be this amazing catalog of planets all across the night sky. And as we can see, TESS is tiling across the night sky, and it is going to fill in the gaps that Kepler wasn't able to look at. And then Kepler's follow-up mission, K2, looked at the ecliptic. So that's the band of sky along the horizontal, along the equator of the night sky. And so Ke between Kepler, K2, and TESS, we have the night sky pretty well covered, and we can start to learn even more about exoplanets. So now to talk about a little bit more about TESS itself. And I think this will be really interesting to you because a lot of you are working on spacecraft and all of these like really in exciting technical projects. So I'll talk a little bit more about the TESS cameras. So these cameras were actually built at MIT Lincoln Lab. They were designed specifically for this mission, and they're really beautiful pieces of hardware. So if you've ever seen an iPhone camera, it's itty bitty, fits on the tip of your finger. The test cameras, the sensors themselves are this big. Has any, anyone ever taken the lens off of a DSLR and looked inside? Yeah? So the sensor on that is, that's, it's the same idea of like the light falls on the sensor and that's how you get your image. And so we have four sensors per camera just because that makes it easier to download the image because it's thousands and thousands of pixels. And those go, if I can use my laser pointer, this is where the sensors lie, right in the optical path, these seven lenses. And then in the back here, you have the focal plane electronics that take the data and dump them into the onboard computer of the spacecraft. These are really beautiful cameras, and they're really small, actually. From end to end, a camera's about this big, and then this big around. So they're really a lot like big wide-angle lenses, or like a really nice camera, but much more powerful. So this is, so to test these cameras, we had to put them in space-like conditions to see how they would react thermally, how they would react to vibration, and what their optical properties would be. So you can see here it tests in one of its, in, its um, in the harness before it goes into the testing chamber, so these vacuum chambers that lower the temperature to minus 75 degrees C, and we're at vacuum. And you can see TESS has a green eye. Does anyone have any? a guess as to why that might be. No? So that's because TESS is looking specifically at stars that are in the red wavelengths. So it's a little counterintuitive, but in order to cut out everything above the green wavelengths, you want to have a co an optical anti-reflective coating that's a little green. And so we show an artificial starlight at these cameras. That's this little grid of fiber optics that we bounce through an optical setup, and we're able to move that around to calibrate the, the camera and the focal plane. The other thing we did was take selfies. So TESS can all, this is a really exciting camera system. Oftentimes with, astro, with astronomical, astronomical telescopes, what you have to do is cool down the telescope so that the electrons settle down and that there's not a lot of noise, so that it's, the electrical noise is quiet. I guess, but TESS is able to have really low, what's called dark noise. And so you can actually operate these cameras at room temperature and get a fairly good picture. And this is a picture of myself and uh, three other astronomers who we were in the lab one day and we're like, hey, it's time for a selfie. 
So we took these four cameras. I was part of the camera testing team measuring the optical properties. And we shipped them off to uh, Northrop Grumman down in Dallas, Virginia. And that's where they assembled them onto the camera plate of the spacecraft. And you see that they're wearing these funny sort of like cones of shame now. And these are um, actually to baffle light. These are called um, lens hoods. And so what they do is that sort of staggered pattern that you see takes any light coming from the Earth or from the sun behind it or from other places that we don't want it coming from, and it baffles it. It uses an interesting interferometric. It's a really interesting optical problem. And so then these are put onto the spacecraft, and they're enshrouded in insulating material. And you can see the, uh, the camera plate getting lowered down onto the spacecraft bus. So this happened in the fall of 2017. And then early in 2018, TESS was all bundled up. You can see someone is working on testing the deployment of TESS's solar panels. And it was put onto a fairing of a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket here at Cape Canaveral. And that was back in April of 2018. And then we started the process of launching a spacecraft. So this is the vehicle assembly building down at Cape Canaveral. I had the opportunity. So this is how it looked like in the 60s. And then this is how it looks like today. So I had the opportunity with a bunch of other astronomers to go there and talk to the press and engage with people about this really exciting launch. And so I got to go down to the launch pad as well. That was really exciting to see the SpaceX launch and like the, all of the rocket pieces everywhere in their launch area. And test launched, and it was a really amazing experience for all of us. And so you can see here, we got some Twitter engagement from NASA people who were very excited to hear about this launch. So Thomas Serbukin is the mission director for many of the things at NASA. And then Jim Bridenstine is the deputy, or the administrator, the NASA administrator. So two very excited. So it's really exciting to see that um, it's really flattering, I guess, that people in NASA who have nothing to do with exoplanets are excited about this mission. So once TESS was in space, it began to get piloted into its orbit around Earth. This is an elliptical orbit. It's every two weeks, so it is a 13-day orbit. And it's actually in a really interesting resonance with the moon. So it's in a two-to-one resonance with the moon, and the moon helps balance it out in its orbit. And so at the end of every two weeks, TESS turns around, and it does a data downlink to the Earth. And so it dumps all of the pictures, gets some more instructions. If we need to tweak the, the software or any of the pointing, that's when we do it. And so this is what TESS has been doing for the last year or so, is being in this orbit. So then it takes pictures that look like this. These are, there are millions of stars in this picture. And I'll just, I'll give you a second to stare at it. So this is a this is an image this is from Tess's first this is the first light image from Tess the first image that Tess took, and you can see here that there's thousands millions of stars actually, and this is the the large Magellanic cloud, and so if you look in these images, nothing pops out as a particularly interesting star right, but each one of these stars has its own unique story to tell. And so we found very, as we started digging through the data, we identified a few really exciting candidates. And that's what I want to tell you about. So we thought, this star, this one looks important. This one looks cool. And we said, let's take a look at it. And how do you find out that a star has an exoplanet around it? First, you have to look down at the pixels. And so you'll say, this is, this is not a great picture of a star. It's just a bunch of blocks, right? But these blocks are full of information. You can count up how much light is in each one of these pixels add it up, and this is the first step in making your light curve. You draw a window around it, and you say, this is my light curve. But I don't see a planet in this yet. So I have to detrend this data. I have to take out all of the noise, all of the weird stuff. And I still don't see a light curve, or I still don't see a transit. So then I have to guess what the period of that orbit is and fold up that light curve until I find something that looks like a transit. And this is starting to look like a planet. This is exciting. So from this, I can get the planet's period, how far away it is from its host star, how big it is, because this amount tells you the ratio between the, the star's total brightness and the brightness removed. And then you can scale that to radius of the star, radius of the planet. 
And so you go from pixels to a pretty good picture in your mind of what a planet looks like. So we do this for thousands and thousands of stars in a very automated way. Um, so you have millions of these stars, and you have to go through each one. But we get computers to do a lot of this for us. We use machine learning, and we use decision trees and other powerful software to go through a lot of these and rule out planets for us. But when we get down to the really good ones, that's when we say, OK, these are exciting. Let's look at these by eye and try and get some notes on what we want to do first with these planets. So that's what we do in this software. So the team I manage is the team that actually gets to do this, gets to take the first real look at these planets. And it seems that we've found some really exciting things. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the discoveries that Tess has made. So this first planet, um, we unfortunately don't get to name planets anything exciting. Um, we have to give them these number names that are easy for computers to read, but not for us. So this was one of the first planets Tess found, and this was the first sort of um, Earth-like planet. So it's three Earth radii, and it has a relatively cool temperature of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's actually part of a system. We found out we, um, our team, along, so Diana Dragomir was the, the primary scientist on this, found that it's actually part of a system. And the second planet in the system, let me just check my notes, this one is rocky, and it has an eight-day orbit. So a lot of these planets have really short orbits. And so the first planet had an orbit of 36 days. And that's maybe one of the longest planet periods that we found so far. But imagine that, going around a star every, every month. Your birthday is every month. Happy birthday. So this is another planet that we found, LHS 3844. And this is just starting to give you a picture of where these planets are. So it was. Um, around a star that was much smaller than ours, which meant that even though the, the star is, even though the, and then the planet was, do, 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 the planet was really close to its host star, which meant that its period was 11 hours. So 11 hours is the time that it takes for it to orbit its host star. And how can it do it? How can it do this? Well, the star is very small. It's only about 15% of the size of the sun, and it's also much cooler than the sun. And when a star is cooler, it gets redder. And so this is a picture of what it would look like if you stood on the surface of this planet. It would be very hot, maybe lava-like. And you would look in the sky. It would be very clear, because there's no atmosphere. And the star would be red. But we've also found systems that are a little bit more interesting, that remind us more of Neptunes. This system is really exciting, because this was the, the the planet that you had heard about. This was the smallest planet that Tess has found. Is, and then it has another planet that's actually um, Venus-like, perhaps. And so this animation, though, tells you that there's probably not life on any of these planets, because this is a really active star. You can see that the radiation coming off of the star in this animation means that these planets are receiving 4 to 22 times the amount of um, radiation that we get here on Earth from our sun. Have any of you heard of solar storms or solar weather or yeah or like that's something that always happens in like disaster movies right? Is there's like a huge solar planet like knocks out the power on the eastern seaboard like this is happening all the time on these planets. So these are just a few examples to sort of get your get your sort of imagination going as like we're starting to see that some of these planets look nothing like Earth and some of them really do. They're like these Venusian or hot Jupiter-type planets that have a really thick atmosphere that we want to study with more powerful telescopes. And so um, where is that other one? I added another one. Or did I? I guess not. Um, OK, so I'm going to return to this plot and show you um, this plot, but what, now with orange dots. And the orange dots are planets that Tess has found. And so Tess is filling in this neighborhood around our sun of things that are nearby that we can observe that are really bright with other telescopes. And I have a question for everyone. Why do you think we would want stars to be really bright? Or why do you think, how do I phrase this? What's an advantage of observing bright stars with a space telescope? The data is more clear, that's for sure. You in the back with the green sweater, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then another thing is that a bright star that's bright for a space telescope is much easier for a ground-based telescope to observe. 
And that's one of the advantages of having a space telescope, is there's no atmosphere, you don't have to wait for it to be nighttime, you have no problems with weather, it's really nice, but here on Earth you have all of those problems to deal with. You have this huge atmosphere in the way that like makes the light bounce around and makes it very difficult to observe stars. So the fact that we have a huge catalog now of these test stars that, how do I pause this? Yeah, that's not what I wanted, but okay. Um, now that you have this huge catalog of test stars that are nearby and bright, we can look at these with ground-based observatories and be very busy <laughs> for the next many years. So TESS, in this first year, my team has helped us put together this big, huge catalog of 993, almost 1,000 targets. Maybe next week we'll get to 1,000. Um, from 12 sectors of data, almost the first, we've looked through almost all of the data from our first year. Um, we've found over 200, almost 300 planets that are between Earth and Neptune size, which is exciting for us. And we have 27 that have papers written about them. And so I'll talk a little bit now about astrophysics with TESS. So this is things, um, things that are not planets that TESS can look at. So actually before we, um, before we started taking science data, we were taking preliminary data to better understand the telescope. And we saw something really interesting whiz through our field of view. And this is a comet. And you can see some of the features of a comet in this image. You can see the little bit of like a cometary tail. And it's changing direction as the comet moves around the sun. And the comet's tail always streams away from the star that it's orbiting. And this is exciting as well because now people have um, started to use the test data for looking for comets and other near-Earth objects. Another thing that tests can look at is supernovae. So a little bit about supernovae. They happen when a star dies. So you have a star that's consuming all of its fuel, and eventually it collapses in on itself, and the pressure is so great that it explodes, and it releases this huge, bright shell of very hot plasma. And you can see this little red line here is the sharp increase in brightness from this particular star. But this signature is very unique to each type of star and exactly how it supernovas. And so with TESS, we've been able to see many different kinds of supernovae. And this is really exciting because often when you observe a supernovae from Earth, um, what all you can see is when it gets really bright, when it became that big blue shell. But with TESS, we have two weeks of data beforehand, so we're able to look back in time at what that star was doing before it exploded. And this is really exciting because it lets us find out, okay, what exactly was its brightness doing? Was it really active? What, what was going on? And this is a really unique opportunity. Before tests, we only had five stars that we'd seen before they went supernova. And so you have this sort of movie of before it happened now. The other exciting thing about tests is all of our data is public, which means that you can help us discover exoplanets. So this is going to be my call to action for you to hop onto Zooniverse. And this is a project run by a graduate student, Nora Eisner, at Oxford. And um, it's a really amazing program where you can look at light curves yourself and try and identify transits. And actually, some of these planets for Kepler um, led to papers. So you could actually be part of a publication by helping us vet light curves with this software. So this is how the map of TESS's sectors is coming together. This is sectors 1 through 12. It's giving us this really unique perspective of the night sky. And it's it's really something to sort of ponder and think about is we look at the night sky and we have no idea what's out there, but now with missions like TESS and like the whole history of astronomy, we're starting to build up this really wonderful picture of what, there, what sort of things there are. Um, and so I will close by giving you another little perspective of we've looked at Earth from many different perspectives over the history of uh, research in scientific fields. And so some of you are really interested in space systems and satellites and other technologies and looking at Earth from, for example, the moon. Um, and the test gives us an opportunity to look at space from this perspective and try and figure out by looking outwards what our own solar system looks like. So I will take any questions now. Thank you. Yeah. 
Right. Oh, yeah, that's well spotted, actually. So um, the gaps, of course, are because if you ever try to tape strips of paper to a beach ball, that's what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, you're talking about these, the little bright spots. So those are actually, um, that's actually scattered light. So remember I talked about the lens hoods and how they try and block some of that scattered light? Well, unfortunately, they don't get all of it. So there's a little bit of light that leaks in through there and then actually through the mating of the lens hood and the camera. So that's one of the interesting, it's an interesting engineering problem that we had to think about is how do we design the cameras such that we block out as much light as possible and then also we know some light is going to get in. How do we model this system such that we can measure how much light it is and make a decision about how bad it's going to be? Um, I'll start over here. Yeah, in the pod shirt. Yeah, so you take your light curve, and um, a lot of the time you fit, you, there's different algorithms you can use to fit a light curve, and so you can say, I'm going to take a box, and every so often I'll move this box along, and I will see if anything fits the shape of this box. Or I can use a trapezoid, or I can just give this light curve a range of random periods, and I'll say, is this a period of 0 0.01 days, 0 0.015 days, 0 0.02 days, and just guess along that and say, OK, if it's every 0.02 days, I'll divide my data up into 0.2 day chunks and then stack them on top of each other and see if there's a transit there. There's a bunch of different ways that people do light curve analysis to try and find transits. There are a bunch of other questions in this section. And I'm biased because I really like space stuff. Yeah, here. That's a great question. We're actually do, we actually just got funding for something called the Extended Mission, which is two more years of funding for tests to look in more detail at the top and bottom of those two um, halves of the test sphere. And this is really great because those are already overlapping continuously. So we have almost a year of data at the polls. And so this will give us an opportunity to look more closely at those. What was your question? I think, yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. The question was about, so how does the distance that it takes for light to travel affect both our like, astronomical research? Yeah, so we're always looking back in time when we're looking at um, things in the night sky, and it's just how far back in time we're looking. So if we're looking at a distant galaxy, that's many thousands of light years away. So we're, off court, we're of course, looking many thousands of years in that um, galaxies pass, but the brightest star in our sky, Alpha Centauri, or the nearest star in our sky, Alpha Centauri, is only five light years away. So for that star, we're only looking five years in the past. So we, we, I think everybody sort of just goes into it knowing this is going to be fine, <laughs> that we're looking in the past for a little bit of time travelers. Yes? I think, so there, I think there's two parts to the question is, have we found planets in the habitable zone? And if so, could there be life on them? And so we have, so TESS has not found any habitable zone planets yet, but Kepler definitely has planets in the habitable zone of their host star. But the second thing we need to do to find out about whether that planet could host life is look at their atmosphere, because Venus and Earth are the exact same size. So if an alien was observing Venus and saw it transit, they'd be like, oh, hey, this is in the habitable zone of its host star. Maybe it hosts life. And then they could hop on their spaceship and go to Venus, and they say, oh, hey, this is a terrible place to live. Um, and so you actually have to look at uh, planets with what's called a radial velocity telescope, a, spectro a telescope that can look at the spectrum of a planet and find out what its composition is. And so based on that information, we can say, OK, does this planet have oxygen, sulfur, methane, and figure out what the biosignature of that planet is, and if so, like how far it is along in its evolutionary history. But it's a really interesting question, one that people who are interested in biology and chemistry are also trying to understand, is are we, um, what are really the ingredients for life? And if we were to look at our own atmosphere, would we be able to tell from the outside how far we are along in our evolutionary history? Uh, blue shirt in the back. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, so you can scale cameras, and so the idea, so there's an, yeah, Tesla's was designed to be compact, which is why we're refracting telescope and we use the glass and the, the sensor at the bottom. But Hubble, for example, is a huge mirror, and then you have all the light collected on the mirror, bounces off of that and into a, a thing that collects the light here. And so that's often the traditional design for space telescopes is a big mirror with a, a collection instrument here. Um, but tests was designed, but with that you have to think about other launch parameters like weight, cost. And so there's a lot of different ways to do telescope design and test was just one choice. Yeah. Yeah, with a striped shirt. With planet, oh, planet nine? Yes, um, that is that there's another planet beyond Pluto. Okay, um, yeah, what about it? Yes, so TESS can look at things within our solar system. So the video I showed was a comet, which was in our solar system. Um, for things like Planet Nine, you have to think about light, and that TESS is collecting, TESS is really good at gathering light. And so when you have really faint things, like distant planets in our own solar system, you have to think about how bright do these planets look to TESS, and are we looking in the right places at the right time? Are we going to be looking at the plane of, that, of Pluto, or for example, like a, an outer solar system object as it's crossing through TESS's field of view. So we'd have to also get a little bit lucky with where we were looking and see if the brightness of that thing were detectable by TESS. I wanna go over here for some questions. I'll start over here, gray shirt right here. Do we know if it's tightly locked? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a thing that happens for sure, is a planet will get stuck. Um, I, it might be, I don't remember, I'd have to check the paper, but that's a good question. Yeah. How would you solve the Fermi paradox? How would I solve the Fermi paradox? Um, the Fermi paradox, um, does anyone here, does, does everyone here know what it is? I'll define it a little bit. Um, it's this idea that you can say, the probability of us being able to observe this planet, the planet, the, it's just stacking up a bunch of probabilities of the probability that it has an atmosphere, that it has life, that it has this, that it has civilization, that that civilization hasn't annihilated itself, that the, the civilization is online. Um, you take all of those probabilities and say, okay, what's the probability that we can detect life? And the idea is that that probability is actually fairly high depending on how you tune those parameters. But we haven't seen, it's not general knowledge if we have or have not seen um, life. So <laughs> the idea with that is, oh, the, if, it, if, it's a, if it's general knowledge, we won't know until the, um, what is it, the Naruto runners, Storm Area 51. <laughs> so we'll find out in September. But um, <laughs> To answer your question about the Fermi paradox, um, the idea with that is like the probability is there, but at the same time, there's, there's so much that we have to find out first about these planets and about just sort of characterizing what is out there that we sort of need to build up a population of potentially even habitable planets before we can really make any guesses. And that's the exciting thing about these telescopes is that we're actually able to put numbers to those different terms in the Fermi paradox. Other questions? In the back, white t-shirt. Yes, you actually could. So you can also look for exomoons and another ex interesting thing which is exocomets. And that's actually, a, a team has done that. They have found the first exocomet. You next time had a question. The distance of a planet from Earth, like in our solar system? Yeah. Ooh. Um, so we look at its like relative motion across this across the sky, and we figure out, okay, like this is moving at this speed, and so if it's like in Earth's gravitational orbit, we just plug the, that into Newton's law, and hope for the best. Um, oh, are you talking about whether Pluto is a planet? <laughs> I hope so. 
<laughs> we sent a very expensive spacecraft to it, so I'm going to be mad if it's not real. Um, it's definitely real. Like, we sent the, um, what was it called? We sent the New Horizons missions there that was actually designed and launched here at MIT. And New Horizons was really exciting because it brought us the first high resolution image of Pluto. And Pluto is, um, but there's interesting conversation about Pluto because it's actually a dwarf planet. It's a small planetesimal that has a moon that's about the same size at it, as it is. So it never fully cleared out its orbit. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting conversation about planet terminology. So Earth is Earth size, but we have these giant planets that are these humongous hot Jupiters that are close into their host star. And so we're starting to learn a lot about all the different kinds of planets that there are. All right, some questions from the middle. Yes. from a light curve. OK, so a planet size, as someone noted over here, you can get that from the ratio of the, the dip and the change in brightness, and then the use of the distance from its host star. So that's from the period. That's just like the circumfer like the 2 pi over t idea. Um, and so you can extract, but the thing that you have to take into account with that is the eccentricity of that orbit. So if you assume a circular orbit, it's fairly easy to calculate. But if it's a really weird elliptical orbit, you have to use other data to figure out um, that term as well. Yeah. Um, so we want to look at stars that are redder because those are smaller. And so the ratio between the size of the planet to the size of the star will be bigger. So those will be easier to detect. And so we're definitely skewing our sample of stars. And that will skew what kinds of planets we discover. But it makes them more detectable. There was a question in the back. Yeah? Right. So if you find the, the spectral signature for water, you want to start then. That'll, that's really exciting. Um, and congratulations if that's going to be you. Um, and, then if, and then you want to see what else is in that planet's atmosphere. Is it carbon dioxide? Is it methane? What else is there? Because in our atmosphere, we see water. We also see nitrogen, methane, other things. And we want to then match that to atmospheres on Earth that we know support life. We know that in our own um, on Earth, but that's like something that we also don't know that well on Earth. That's actually still a huge mystery here, is detecting with precision um, yeah, there's two technological problems. There's one is like detecting with precision different signatures in the spectra of these um, of these uh, molecules that we know sustain life. And so you always want to just like get more data, learn in more detail like what is on that planet's surface, and then start to imagine what kind of life could be there, how far along could it be. If we see radioactivity, maybe that really is a signature of life because someone's figured out radioactive behavior and has something in their atmosphere that's radioactive. Maybe there's a weird isotope of neon or something. We say, OK, you could only have that isotope of neon if you knew how to isolate it and put it into the atmosphere. So that must mean there's intelligent life. Or maybe there's just like a bunch of methane, which could just mean there's a bunch of multicelled or unicelled organisms there. Or you can start thinking about like the weirder um, habits, habitats on Earth. So you have. Um, what are they called? Uh, water bears that like live in um, like the deep sea vents and like in Antarctica. And so you could start thinking about that and get creative with. We have these really weird environments here on Earth where there is life, and these environments actually could look like environments on other planets. That's a good question. In the back, red T-shirt. Sure. So I think TESS is a really good example of the collaboration between industry and government because um, the having SpaceX as a competitor 
in the economic model meant that they had a cheaper rocket that we could use as a launch vehicle. But I think there's all, it's really interesting, and if any of you are actually interested in policy and the more political government side of how science interacts with corporations and with the government, that's a really interesting field to go in and like has a lot of these really tough questions that people are thinking about, is there's no economic demand for finding exoplanets. We're not gonna be able to set up a Disney World on one of these exoplanets anytime soon. Um, but the technologies that we're developing, the machine learning tools that we're developing, these are things that end up being part of the economy. The scientists that are trained end up be working in the private sector often. And so um, it's really interesting because um, scientific research, even though it sort of seems to be just for fun, often produces real economic benefit. And so it's a really interesting question. So if you're interested in policy, um, science is actually a really great way to get into that. Yeah. That's a good question. So the question was about these constellations of networking satellites that provide internet to low, remote areas. And so there's actually a huge public outcry against the Elon Musk, um, the SpaceX project. I forget what it was called. What was it called? Starlink. Starlink. Um, because, yeah, these little s satellites are really bright, actually, in the night sky. And so if you have one sort of traveling through your field of view and you're observing on Mauna Kea with one of the big telescopes and it flies through your field of view and it, rec and it flies in front of the star you're trying to observe, it's going to wreck your night. Um, so this is just an unfortunate part of um, having the, those technologies. And then the other side of that that's really interesting is what happens when they deorbit and how they affect other things that are in orbit. And so it's actually that's another really interesting policy question is how do we start regulating and regulating in an equitable way the night sky, not only from an ethical standpoint, but from also the standpoint of people wanting to um, put things into space, not only to understand space better, but to make things connected. Yeah. Question in the back. So for the Milky Way, it, um, I actually have a picture on my laptop of part of the Milky Way. Uh, let me try and pull it up. Do, do, do. Hold, please. Um, so to answer your question, the Milky Way is made out of mostly dust. Um, but it also has like a lot of gaseous structures. And so one of the things that you can do with that is um, think about, oh, here we go. This is where it is. I just had this. These are really pretty, which is why I want to show them. Um, we have these really nice pictures from sectors 12 and 19. Sector 9 through 13, there we go. Which way? There we go. So this is a chunk of the Milky Way, and as you can see, there's, you can see some gas and dust, but then you can also see the stars. And so if I zoom in on just part of the Milky Way and wait for the camera to catch up, you can see that you can actually resolve point sources fairly well, and then the, the structures that are a little bit fuzzier are, are the gas. And it's really interesting because the wavelength range that TESS looks at means that you can actually see through some of the gas that's transparent to red wavelengths that is opaque in the visible wavelengths. So it's actually really cool. But then the, de the other thing is that why you see a blob sometimes is because the density of stars is so great that you can't pick out individual sources in the TESS pixels. Other questions? Yes.
That's a really interesting question about satellite design is has, Ke has TESS been as much of a return on investment as Kepler was? So yes, Kepler was one telescope that looked at a small part of the sky for four-ish years, six-ish years, and saw thousands of planets. Um, and it did one thing very well, and that was to take a census of that patch of the sky. And so, but we wanted to do something different. We wanted to look at the whole sky. And so TESS is doing very well at doing exactly that. And so that's like one of the interesting things about designing a mission is defining what you want to measure well so that you can motivate that. And so there's other exoplanet hunting telescopes that are now in development and are shortly going to launch. So the European Space Agency is launching one called CHAOPS um, that is going to be a little bit more like halfway between Kepler and TESS. It has many cameras on it, but it can only point in one direction at once. And so you have astronomers asking for time on CHAOPS to look at their pet target. And so that's one way of using a telescope is to have everyone take turns, whereas TESS just looks at everything. And then people can go play with the data however they want. So it's just different ways to approach looking at something and just making sure that that's unique enough and has enough benefits that it's worth funding. TESS is not able to spot black holes, but something interesting that TESS can spot is something called a tidal disruption event, or a TDE. So the accretion disk around a black hole is all of the things that the that black hole is working on eating. And sometimes when a star gets too close to a black hole, it gets sucked in and it emits a huge blast of bright light. And so that's what's called a tidal disruption event. And TESS has actually been able to detect one of those. So there's a paper on that. I saw a question back here. Yeah. Mm, what, so what's the ideal lifetime for a telescope? So it's, that's a question that we're starting to think about because like the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, has been in operation for 30, almost 40 years. Kepler was in operation for almost a decade. TESS is designed to, was designed to only work for two years, but it's likely going to be able to work for many, many decades because its orbit is stable and it doesn't use a lot of fuel. So the ideal is that you build something for a prime mission that covers the amount that you were funded for, so generally that's two years, but you try to build something to, be, uh, to have longevity. And so we're starting to see that these big space telescopes are having a lifetime of several decades, which is great because it means we have this reliable observatory in space. However, you don't always need that. Sometimes you just want something that works once and then you don't need to use it anymore. But if you're going to go through all the trouble of putting something into space, you want to work as long as possible. And so that's why like the Mars rovers were such an interesting thing because this rover was only supposed to last 90 days and it ended up going for what, how long, like two years, four years? And so what, opportunity, yeah. How long did it go? Opportunity was 15 years, really? Wow. So the so but yeah for example like these these you you want to design things well, I think that's the the, the sort of general answer, yes. Based on the previous question, what is what would test be useful for after it has the whole sky? What would test be useful for? Um, it I think we can always map the sky again. Like um, that's actually one of the things that we really care about is you if you look at something once like sort of if so we saw like the map of the sectors and you saw that like we only look at one sector for 27 days and then move on and so if something is transiting in that sector and we don't see it again if we don't observe it again we sort of lose precision on when that's that planet transits that star and so if we're able to repeat that measurement every time we repeat a measurement we in improve our precision um, and that's true in any science or engineering field. And so actually having something that can repeat a measurement is also really valuable. Um, I think something interesting TESS could do is focus on particular parts of the sky and mapping those more precisely. But because it's designed to be a survey telescope, um, it'll probably, its main thing to do is um, do surveys. But that's actually a really interesting point. Um, the WISE telescope is another one of these space telescopes that was initially designed, I think, as an X-ray observatory, 
but it lost all of its cryogen, all the liquid nitrogen that was used to cool the telescope. And so when that happened, they're like, well, we're not gonna just deorbit this and throw this away. We're going to change it into something that we can still use it for. And so it became NEOWISE, which is now looking for near-Earth objects um, around the Earth. And so you can always repurpose a telescope. And so it's a really interesting engineering question to figure out how to do that. Yes. Um, a little bit of the processing happens a little bit on the spacecraft where we're stacking images and compressing them for transmission. And then when we get them on Earth, that's when we really do a lot of the analysis. There's a question here. Yeah, so I think you mentioned something like 27 papers had been written about different mm -hmm. objects. Um, it's actually a lot of per star papers. Um, people also try to start looking at populations. So how many M dwarfs are there? How many hot Jupiters are there? Trying to start figuring out some of the population questions. But a lot of these papers are sort of looking at a handful or one or two planets and studying those systems in detail. Because the better we understand individual systems, the better we can scale. Yes, Dad. <laughs> Yes, but we, oh, so it, if Tess is here, the sun is here, and we're here. We wouldn't see it because we wouldn't want to point directly at the sun, because that would be bad for the camera. Oh, would we be able to see Earth? Um, okay, that's a really interesting question. If aliens built a Tess and were looking for us, what would, would they be able to see us? And the answer is maybe. Um, <laughs> because Earth only transits once every 365 days. So we'd have to be looking at the patch of sky in which our sun is for longer than 365 days in order to see it transit once. So we'd have to look at it for twice that time to see it transit twice. So we'd have to just be very lucky or very consistent with our observing plan, or the aliens would. So we could, in fact, find an Earth analog. It would just take a lot of time. Yes, if it's only looking at it in the bottom part of that, um, if it's only looking at it in the camera that's only looking for 27 days. If the target is in the part that's like in the overlapping region, that region gets about 100 days, I think, um, of observation. And so you'll be able to see something if it transits once, that has a period of 100 days. If it transits twice in that time, a period of 50 days and going on. So that's like one of the things is like, do you want to spend all of your resources looking at one part of the sky, like Kepler, or do you want to sacrifice that, those longer period planets, to look for the things that Tess can find? Way in the back. That's a question. So what's next after Tess? So there's a bunch of different ideas, and this is actually a really fun creative space to live in. One idea is like, well, we know how to build tests really well, so why not build it a bunch more times? So that's, um, I think it's like the economics of scale or something. Is like you invest a lot of money to figure out how to manufacture a thing. And once you've done that, you don't have to pay that money ever again. You can just keep manufacturing the thing for just the cost of materials. And so we could do that with tests. We could build more tests, put them in the same orbit, and have a different observing pattern and play around with that. But I mentioned the KOPS telescope. Um, and then there's other telescopes that are in development, like the James Webb Space Telescope, which is supposed to launch in 2021. And that is going to be able to actually look at um, the spectra of these planets and their host star. And that'll actually get, answer the questions that you guys had about the atmospheres of these planets and characterizing um, the compositions of these planets. So people, when, um, when you're designing a mission, you always want to be looking at what's been done before, but you also kind of want to see what's going to be ahead and how your mission can complement what's going to happen in the next decade or so. Maybe it's time for one, one more. more question. <laughs> Maybe you would like to pick, because you know the students. Ah, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. 
totally. So actually, um, there's another research. So Carrie Cahoy and Sarah Seeger are two professors at MIT who have started thinking about CubeSats for exoplanets. So Sarah, um, a few years ago, she had a CubeSat called Asteria that had a very interesting camera design, and it was used to study one particular star and its particular exoplanet. So that's one of the things that we were we've been talking about a little bit is that um, you this thing of do I want to stare at one patch of the sky or get all of the sky, and what do I sacrifice by doing that? And so if you have a CubeSat, you can just stare at your favorite star all the time um, for as long as that CubeSat is in orbit. So that's like one of the advantages of CubeSats is that you can hog all of the time all of the observing time that that CubeSat has. Um, but yeah, people are also playing around with what if we made a big telescope out of many small telescopes in space the same way we do on Earth. CubeSats would be a great way to prototype those sorts of networks. Great question. Yeah. 